Good morning and welcome to August at Warrington Bible Fellowship. Happy Sunday also to those of you worshiping with us in the space before us and those that are tuning in electronically and virtually. We do seek your face, O Lord, and we do thank you for the many opportunities you give us to gather together in that ancient tradition of worshiping you in heart and mind and soul, in spirit and in truth. Well, the word August, of course, in its ancient Latin tradition means backpacks. Did you know that? (laughs) Uh, Roman parents would tell their kids, don't forget your August, as they would go out the door in the morning. I'm just kidding, of course, but this is backpack month. And Katschwitz is the backpack commandant, and she is the one that's coordinating our effort to bring backpacks to the local community. Those backpacks are chock full of really cool things, crayons and paste that you can eat in an emergency, those kinds of things, remember. But Kat is the one who's in charge, and Wednesday is shopping day for the backpack operations. So if you'd like to make a donation, please do that before Friday this week. And if you'd like to also participate, please get a hold of Kat. She knows she needs help. Uh, you could be put on the shopping expedition, the packing expedition, the distribution expedition. There's all kind of neat things that we can do to further the backpack operation here in the Warrington area. Also, you've heard this before, if you go online often enough, that Warrington Bible Fellowship's website, you know, we do have the subscribe button. You can also push, remember they always say down here, that alert button, which will give you an alert or a notification if something's changed on the website. So if you'd like to, please subscribe to WBF online and select alert so that you can get changes as to what's happening also sometimes here at church, but also you can always call the office. Now, as of course, another ancient tradition we observe as followers of the Most High God, is that moment when we prepare ourselves for the wondrous privilege of being in a special way before his presence on the Sabbath. So as we bow our heads this morning and prepare ourselves for the wonderful privilege and the -the on-the-job training, because this will be our future forever, is to worship him and to serve him. So in a sense, this is on-the-job training for us. But as we bow our heads and we seek to put away that which is around us and to then focus on the one who dwells in us and around us, the one who is for us, protects us, and provides for us, let's think again about the immensity of worshiping a God who is the same now as he will be in 1.68 million years. Unchanging unrivaled, untouched. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Mighty God, we ask often, who are we that we could come into your presence in such a special, beautiful, and intimate way? The way that you provided for us by the life, noble life, and breathtaking sacrifice of your blessed Son, who is God and man, Jesus. We now give you the hearts that you gave us. We give them back to you, mighty one, And we seek your face. We seek your favor. We want to know your way. We want to be indwelt more brightly and more powerfully by your presence, your mighty spirit, so that we might be real people, sons and daughters of the Most High God. Father, would you provide for us that which we truly need, that you'd help us discern wisely what is a want and what is a need, and in so doing then help others with their needs as your agents of salt and light. Here we gather, mighty one, if you have instructed us to do so over the centuries for the sake of our own good and that of your community, your church, that this place would be a place where we go to do your good work, which is in your world. Father, we have many concerns. We pray now that you would search our hearts, that you would meet our true needs, that we would be comforted, encouraged that we would be motivated to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, the real person, the only person from conception to death to leave and to live a truly moral life. Help us, mighty God, by your presence. Motivate us to be the ones you've always wanted us to be. And we do ask these things, mighty one, in the blessed name of your son, Jesus the Christ. It's in him and him alone that we seek righteousness and true life. Amen and amen. And now we continue worshiping in the beauty and the might of the voice and the guitar. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy. 
appreciate all that uh, Jimmy just said. Um, reminded me how it directly tied into what Pastor Kavakas said last week, that we need to have a glimpse of eternity. And in order to see into eternity, I think we need to have our eyes opened, especially the eyes of our heart. Uh, stand with us and sing, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. We sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 sing you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love. As we sing, holy, 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 I want to see you, holy, 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 holy. Just 
Spirit leads me on in the power of your love. Lord, unveil my eyes, let me see you face to face the knowledge of your love. Pastor John talked about being humbled 
Last week, we learned of a blind man who came to Jesus for sight. This week, we're going to see a small, humble man humble himself before Jesus. And in John chapter 12, we read, Now those who who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So they came to Philip and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. May that desire be an expression of our hearts in this next song, When We See Your Face. Though the dark is overwhelming And the brightest lights grow dim Though the word of God is trampled on By foolish men Though the wicked never stumble and abound in every place, we will all be humbled when we see your face. And the demons we've been fighting, those without and those within, will be underneath our feet to never rise again. All our sins will be behind us Through the blood of Christ erased And we'll taste your kindness When we see your face We will see Lord, I need you. Lord, 
but I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart. Scripture reading this morning is from James chapter 2, verses 18 to 26. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone, and in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's continue worship this morning as we do our catechism and also our offering this morning. We offer, remember, that which the Lord God has already given us. And we look at it as an investment in, a, in an eternal idea and institution that is God's and does not change. So if you really want to make an investment that has a really high return, we recommend the kingdom of God, do we not? Didn't Jesus inform us that our return would be hundreds of times, dozens of times? We're not looking at a mere 3 to 5% return on these investments. We're looking on a return that will blow our minds and will glorify the one true God. We do have several ways for you to make that investment in the kingdom work of the Lord here at WBF, and that is, of course, online giving through the mail or um, just bringing it here to the box that are located throughout the building. 
I do laud you again, encourage you uh, to make those things available to the Lord, that he's going to do what he wants to do, but he allows you and I to participate in the wonderful privilege of investigating that which he has for us and investing in that which he has for us. Let's pray, shall we? For mighty God, we do recognize again the opportunities you've showered upon us to do those things that honor you among men and women and children. And we desire that you would move our hearts and our minds into that place where we understand without any doubt the conviction that everything we have is yours. Our heart, our minds, our souls, all that you have given to us is yours. Take from us that which you desire and teach us to join in you joyfully, which that you will do through us. Again, in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, we ask these things, saying together, Amen. Well, let's catechize, shall we? Okay, then. We've been talking about prayer these last few weeks, haven't we? We've talked about prayer being basically our life and breath with the Lord Jesus and with his Father and the blessed Spirit dwelling in us, that we then receive through Scripture his word and then speak back to him those truths. So this morning, question 41, if you'll read it with me, it should be on the screen behind me. What is the Lord's Prayer? Now, I know you've memorized it. Would you please read it with me? Because that's how we do catechism, right? All right, here we go. Our Father in heaven, how would be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, these words are called the Lord's Prayer, but they might more accurately be called the Disciples' Prayer. This is the sequence that our Lord gave his disciples, which means you and me, as followers of the one true God. But if you look carefully, not only is this a recitation, it is an outline of how to pray. Look at these eight important patterns that we see in the Lord's Prayer. One, the one true God is Father. He is paternal protector and provider too. The one true God is in and of heaven. The unchanging realm, he is eternal. Three, the one true God is so holy, even his name is special. Four, the one true God, his will unifies heaven and earth, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. And someday that will will come true, and those two realms will be rejoined. Fifthly, the one true God is the sole source of meeting all our needs in their proper manner and in proportion. Sixthly, the one true God is the only agent by which our moral deficiencies, we call them sins, can be remedied. Seven, the one true God expects us to have mercy on and forgive others as he has done for us. Eight, the one true God forgives us, expects us to forgive others, and now we pray that his good and pleasing will overrides our fallen nature and that we will not be tested or tempted, but remain faithful to him. And ninth, the one true God is our shield and defender, and the only one who can rescue us from our mortal enemy, Satan. All of that in those few words. Jesus' economy, of course, is perfect. As Jesus said, as recorded in the sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, verse 9, Jesus said to his disciples, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven... How would be your name? So, what is the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, how would be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. me. Hey, before we get to our passage today, uh, let me share this with you. Uh, We introduced this year's backpack program last week. Uh, We didn't have a lot of notice, so we're running on short notice this year. We've got to get all this taken care of by the 7th. Uh, The good news is you've responded fantastically. We've got $970 of the approximate $2,000 that we need. Uh, So we're going to ask you to continue to support us in prayer, continue to support us financially. We've got 40 backpacks. They're sitting over in my office. You want to take a look at them? They look fantastic. Uh, They're going to go into the hands of students that might not be able to afford the things they need to start school. 
Uh, now, traditionally, we go over the amount that we ask, and if we get over $2,000, we're just going to go back to the county and ask for more backpacks. Uh, so, we look forward to your participation. If you have any questions, come and ask us. So, I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 19. Today, we're going to be in verses 1 through 27. And while you're turning there, let me share this with you. Uh, back when, when almost all of our communication came through our mailbox... Uh, Kelly and I received a letter and it said how would you like to spend three days in New York City without, without any expenses hotel in Manhattan dinner on the, the restaurant and, and we looked at that and of course we'd seen those things before we know you know and there's, there's five pages of, of fine print after it that pretty much say you got to sit down for a presentation now, we'd been to one or two and survived them, and we thought, well, we can do this. Three days in Manhattan is fantastic, so we drive up to Manhattan. We go to Hilton on 57th Street. The place is fabulous. We've got a wonderful room, and we spend the first afternoon in Manhattan. We're walking the streets at night. We're going to Times Square having a great time. The next day at 10 o'clock, we got to go in this little room and sit with these people, and we're thinking, oh, this is easy. You know, we're just going to say no. We don't want whatever they're selling. Well, they were selling timeshares. And I, I got to tell you something. I, I, I'm just terrible with this stuff. Kelly's going, no, no, no. And I'm going, well, maybe we should buy it. <laughs> you know, and she goes, no, we said no. <laughs> and, but we sat there for three and a half hours. And I, I began thinking, we can't get out of here. We can't, they're drawing circles and arrows and, you know, and they're, and they're taking this information and that information and, and I'm like, when does this thing end? And finally, you know, I'm tired of it at this point and I'm the easy one on this. And I go, look, we just want to go. Can we go? And the guy looked at me and said something that changed my life forever. And you've heard this before. He said, didn't you realize that some participation is required? And I went, no. He said, didn't you read all that stuff we sent you? Yeah. <laughs> didn't it say that you had to go through this presentation? Yeah. And we didn't know it was going to be three and a half hours. He said, well, it is. <laughs> Did you think we were going to give you this room and this dinner in Manhattan for nothing? And I naively said, yes. <laughs> so, you know, that's the truth that I want you to hold on to today is some participation is required. And, you know, Jimmy used the word uh, was when he was doing the, uh, the offering. And, you know, it's, it's not a great word uh, as, as far as the church today is concerned, but it's something that we need to pay attention to. Now, last week we heard that every passage in the Bible tells us something about God. And we saw that we all come to Jesus in a manner of being deaf, dumb, and blind. We, we, we need the Holy Spirit in order to be able to listen to what He says, to be able to comprehend, to be able to understand what He says, and to be able to see Him, to be able to see the truth and how it applies to our lives. So this week we're going to see that we can experience the fullness of God's kingdom right now. You can experience the fullness of kingdom life right now. It's not fully realized yet. But we can live in the kingdom. This is, this is what was part of our passage last week. Let me remind you, Luke 18, 29 and 30. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more. When? In this time. And in the age to come, eternal life. Now, Jesus isn't saying you, you, you got to abandon your family. You got to live a monastic life. He's saying your priorities have to be structured properly. God has to be your highest priority. If God is your highest priority, then you can enjoy the blessings of the kingdom right now. So in order to do that, in order to walk in the fullness of God's blessing, in order to enjoy the peace and the joy of being in an intimate relationship with our Father in heaven, there are things we should be doing. 
Now, in a lot of corners of the church today, that's a little bit of an offensive statement. And words start coming out like legalist and law and, and that sort of thing. But the fact of the matter is that if we're willing to look at Scripture objectively, we find out that there are things we should be doing. Not things we have to do, but things that we should be doing. So the popular preaching around in, in, in certain circles is Jesus plus nothing. The gospel plus nothing. And that is indeed enough to get saved. Somebody say amen. We don't need more than Jesus Christ to get saved. We don't go through machinations to, to get ourselves in condition to get saved. Jesus takes us the way we are. But if we are going to be stewards of this amazing grace, there should be evidence. There should be evidence in our lives of a radical change. There should be some demonstration that we are set apart, that we are different. There should be a desire. There should be an urging inside us to do things that please God. So our sermon today is, I've got work to do. Think about that for a minute or two. And in our passage, we're going to see two responses to the gospel that reflect that concept that we have work to do. One of them is a tax collector, and it's going to be in verses 1 through 10 of Luke 19. And the other one is the talents. Now, Luke doesn't call them talents. Luke calls them minas. But I needed talents because I wanted to do alliteration. So I robbed it from, from Matthew. Okay, And so we'll see the talents in 11 through 27. Let's take a look at this tax collector. Verse 1, 19. He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Now, some think that Zacchaeus presided over a regional uh, area and that he had several tax collectors working underneath him. Uh, and, and he had authority and he had influence. And he would take a cut of their collections Plus, he would get paid for what he was doing. And all this would make him an exceptionally wealthy man. Now, in, in the passage prior, we saw a rich man who was unable to hear the truth of the gospel and turned away. Now we've got another rich man here. And, and what we found out in the last passage, you've got to be willing to place God above all, all of our riches, all of our possessions, everything that we hold dear. And so now we see this other rich man, and how is he going to react? What, what, what will he respond as far as who Jesus is and what he does? So we find out, verse 3, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. He was curious. He didn't, he didn't know Jesus. He'd probably heard the stories. He'd probably heard rumors of miracles, and there was a buzz in town, the local celebrity pastors coming through. And so he wants to see what's going on. And it says, but on the account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Now, we can make a lot about his size and everything, but the truth of the matter, what Luke wants us to see is that there's some distance between Zacchaeus and Jesus. He's curious. He wants to find out what it's all about. We know that because he's a tax collector, maybe because he's a chief tax collector, he's not very popular. People don't like him. They resent him. They kind of think he's a traitor. Uh, that he sold out uh, his townspeople. But there's a distance between Zacchaeus and Jesus. So he ran on ahead, verse 4, and climbed up into a sycamore tree. I read a commentator that had to have like seven pages on the sycamore tree. It's just a tree. <laughs> and the, the significance of the tree is it's not a very tall tree. It's rather short and rather squat, meaning that Zacchaeus could actually climb it. Okay, so that's why we hear it's a sycamore tree. So he climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. So here's Zacchaeus, curious. What is this all about? Who is this guy? You know, I'm rich, I'm influential. People bow down to me, but really don't like me. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm going to keep my distance. I'll climb up this tree because I want to see him. And in verse 5, and when Jesus, watch this, when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. Now, I don't know about you, 
But if I had never seen the guy, if I was just curious as to what he looked at, and, and I'm hiding up in this tree just so I can see him, and all of a sudden he looks me in the eye and he knows my name. I got little flutters in my heart. What? How does he know my name? Who's he been talking to? What does he think of me? So he says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Oh, I'm in trouble. He needs me to come down out of the tree. Maybe this is his tree. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be climbing it. Hurry and come down, and then the bomb. For I must stay at your house today. What did he say? Stay at my house. I'm not ready for guests. He knows my name. How does he even know where my house is? So Zacchaeus is really aware at this point that there's something very unusual going on here. Something maybe, maybe miraculous, okay? So the fact is that Jesus knows he's up in the tree, knows his name, and he creates some urgency. You got to come down now. And in the phrasing, it, 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 the indication is that I must stay at your house. It is necessary for me to stay at your house. Now he's been talking to the disciples about God's plan. And now he's kind of walking it out in front of the disciples. I got to stay at his house. Wow. So Zacchaeus, verse 6, hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Now Zacchaeus does exactly what he's told to do. First act he does is obedience. And he's thrilled that Jesus is coming to his house. And I, I got to tell you something. You know, we've talked about the culture before. To have the celebrity visitor to the village come to your house is a, an incredible honor. Uh, and so he would have Jesus at his house, but it wouldn't be just Jesus at his house. When Jesus shows up, the whole town would show up. And, you know, there'd be a dinner. Zacchaeus is probably thinking, I've got to get somebody to make dinner. Okay? Uh, and the town dignitaries would be sitting around the table. And the townspeople would come in and just stand against the walls and listen to the conversation. So Zacchaeus immediately becomes a little bit of a celebrity himself. People are like, did you hear? Jesus is going to be over at Zacchaeus' house. We'll go over and see what's going on. So it's an incredible moment. But Zacchaeus is joyful. He's obedient. So we have this joyful tax collector the one guy in the crowd that climbed up in the tree. What about the rest of the townsfolk? Verse 7. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. They complained. And they said, he has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. The neighbors are appalled. Can't believe he's doing this. Now, we've got to figure out what that says about the neighbors. Number one, what it says is they feel more worthy of Jesus' attention than they think Zacchaeus is. Number two, there's pride there. A certain amount of self-righteousness, and, and Jesus has been on this roll about self-righteousness for quite some time during his whole talk about the kingdom since about chapter 9. And they, they also have some preconceptions about who Jesus is. These people love Jesus' miracles. They know there's something very special about him. They love his miracles, but we're finding out more and more they don't particularly care for the people that Jesus hangs out with. They don't particularly care for the people that Jesus cares for. And so as, as we consider all these things, preconceptions, self-righteousness, pride, you know, that, that whole idea of of not caring for the people Jesus cared for. Where does all that lead? Well, we know where it leads. Jesus is closer and closer to Jerusalem with every pet chapter, isn't he? Okay, it leads to rejection. It leads to them yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Meanwhile, look what being with Jesus does to Zacchaeus. Verse 8, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, now, we don't know how much time has passed. We're assuming they're at the house we're assuming that the dinner's been had, there's been conversation. It, it might be something less than that, but that's what we're assuming. So, so 
Zacchaeus says to Jesus, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And there's a total transformation in Zacchaeus. There's a change of behavior. There is a change of heart. There is grief over the sins that he's committed. There's a, and, and, and it's more than just feeling sorry that Jesus showed up. Gee, I wish I hadn't done all that stuff. There is true repentance. There is an eagerness to express righteousness. And this is the difference between being sorry for being caught to do something and true repentance. True repentance demonstrates a change. It brings about a change in life, a change in behavior. Wow. Wow. You know, that's a lot to happen over dinner, isn't it? But it's just a little bit of time with, with Jesus and Zacchaeus is changing. Now, now we look at this, and I, I just we need to think about this for a while. Oh, he's only giving half of his stuff away. Okay, Jesus has some things to say about that. He's going to make it clear what's happened to Zacchaeus. But notice this. As much as the previous set of lessons taught us how desperately we need the Holy Spirit in order to be members of the kingdom and for us to be able to listen to understand and we see now we see that some effort is called for in walking in the kingdom there are things we have to do we've just watched the kids that he he went up the tree I have more to say about that in a little bit he came down the tree he went home and prepared for his guest, and he did it all joyfully, but what we need to understand is that he did it. And what we see in this is that a response to the gospel is required. There has to be a response. God does the calling. God also does the enabling. That's what we found out in the last passage. But there has to be a response. We don't just sit back and assume that once we've been introduced to the kingdom that we can just wait for the end. We just do nothing. I, I think that's the mistake that the Jewish leadership had arrived at in the first century. They thought they were in the kingdom. They thought they didn't have to do anything. They thought that other people who wanted to be part of the kingdom had to become like them. They had all the rules and regulations to do it. They didn't have to exhibit anything other than their heritage, their ethnicity. Huh. So Zacchaeus shows this, this transformation. He's going to give away half of all he owns. But watch this. Yes. He's going to do that and restore everything he's taken unjustifiably fourfold. This is probably going to wipe Zacchaeus out. Yeah, the rich man in a previous passage wouldn't give up anything. And in this passage, you have Zacchaeus who gives up everything. He shows humility. I mean, it took a lot for this dignitary of the region around Jericho to climb up a tree. I, I, just think about it. Some, somebody says, you know, Leslie, the governor is coming over to your house this afternoon for dinner. And you look out your backyard and he has climbed a tree so that he can see you. <laughs> you say, What's he doing in the tree? He's the governor. Okay, what is Zacchaeus doing in the tree? You know, he could probably buy the tree. What's going on here? You know, so he, he demonstrates some humility. He demonstrates repentance. He demonstrates everything that Jesus has been teaching about being a member of the kingdom. And look what Jesus says. After Zacchaeus puts this display of transformation onto the crowd, after his time with Jesus, Jesus said to him in verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus addresses the people's concerns. They were like, what's he doing with sinners? He addresses their self-righteous. He didn't come for them. He came for the lost. Oh, no, 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 no. 
When Jesus comes back, he's coming back for me. Well, he is. But just before he left the first time, he said, I came for the lost. And we've got a period in there that we've got to figure out what to do with the time. Jesus said, I came for the lost. I didn't come for you. Matter of fact, you were the ones that were supposed to be a blessing to the world. You're supposed to bring the word of God to the world. And they were missing it. They certainly missed it with Zacchaeus, didn't they? Wow. The crowd, the crowd had it wrong. Their assessment of Zacchaeus caused them to judge themselves more righteous than this tax collector. So they figured the tax collector was, watch this, unworthy of God's grace. Not a recipient of grace. Not even eligible for God's grace. We are. And they think this when it's them that needs the grace the most. So, so we see that Zacchaeus is now a primary recipient of this amazing grace of God. But we also see that that grace compels Zacchaeus to do two things. Number one, he obeys Jesus. He does exactly what he's told. Comes down from the tree. And number two, he honors Jesus. Not just as hosting him for the dinner, but he honors Jesus by living a transformed life. By putting that life on display. He's not... What, what, Don't get this wrong. He's not doing anything to earn grace. He's already received it. Amen? He's already got the grace. He does these things in appreciation for the grace that he's received. He does these things joyfully. He's grateful for God's grace, and he responds by living a different life. Let's take a look at these talents. Now again... Uh, This is very similar to the parable in Matthew 25. I'm going to give you a challenge, and then I'll give you a prize if you meet up to the challenge. Uh, Compare Matthew 25 to this passage here. Tell me all the differences, and I will allow you to buy me a cup of coffee. (laughs) You know how much I like coffee. So verse 11. As they, who, who, who's the they? This is the crowd that's following them through Jericho. As they heard these things, and you know, it's a little bit more than their eardrums just vibrating. They are considering these things. Uh, They're trying to comprehend everything they've heard. They're trying to absorb it, to appropriate it in their lives. It says, he, Jesus, proceeded to tell a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem, he knows there's not much time left. And because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Now, this is something that the disciples thought. It's something that the people that were following him thought, the kingdom of God. And they probably got that from Jesus saying, the kingdom is near, I'm the kingdom, so on and so forth. But, so it, it, it's not an unreasonable thing for them to think. But the context here is that the disciples and the followers believe the kingdom is coming immediately. And Jesus wants to set them straight. So in verse 12, he said, Therefore... A nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Now, the nobleman is going to leave and he's going to be gone for a while. You see what's happening? (laughs) And when he comes back, he's going to come back as a king. You could put a capital K in there. He's really talking about himself, but he hasn't made that clear yet. So this is a new theme for Luke. And you'll see this theme pop up as we progress through the rest of Luke. Jesus is king. Verse 13, and he said, Calling ten of his servants, he the king, gave them ten minas, and said to them, Engage in business until I come. Now, there's no real significant meaning to the ten, uh, other than it's not the twelve. So we know that Jesus isn't speaking directly and exclusively to the apostles. He's talking, to, he's talking about a group of people. And so uh, the, they're ten trusted residents of the kingdom. Uh, they're, they're residents that, of the kingdom that the king is going to return to. And he gives them what amounts to be about three years of wages. It's an incredible amount of money. He leaves it to them. 
And, and the inference here is that when he comes back, he expects some sort of return. He said, engage in business until I come back. And then in verse 14, we find out some people don't like this. It says, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Now, this is not the 10 and the intention again for, of Luke and Jesus in telling the parable is to say, there's something special about these ones that he's chosen. Okay, but the rest of the people don't like him. And, the, and, and they don't want him as king. So they, they send some people, they go, go after him and tell him not to come back. We don't want him ruling over us. We don't like what he's saying. We don't like what he's doing. And, and so he listens very carefully, the nobleman does, because in verse 15 we say, when he returned, and of course, when he returns, He's the king. You can't say those things to a king. So there's a whole lot in this phrase. When he returned, having received the kingdom, the nobleman's going to come back as a king. He's going to be away for a while. Jesus taught his followers that he was the kingdom. Now he's teaching them that the fullness of the kingdom is not going to happen immediately. But surely he's going to return. And when he does, that will be the fullness of the king. That's the significance of going from the nobleman to the king. The fullness of the kingdom isn't here yet. So it says, He ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. So when the king returns, he wants to know, what did you do with what I gave you? Where is it? Clearly, you know, as we understand who the king is, and we understand who the servants are, this sets us up as believers of having some responsibility to use what God has given us to make a return on his gifts for the sake of his kingdom, for the sake of the king. We need to think about this. Because I love the teaching that I don't have to do anything. That makes the rest of my life easy. I don't have any obligations. There are no demands on me. Jesus plus nothing. But that's, that's not what this story says, is it? I mean, look, let's let it roll out and see what happens. What, what I want to show you is that everyone, believers and unbelievers alike, will have to answer to Jesus when he comes back. There's no opting out. Everybody's going to have to respond. Okay? So, in verse 16, we find out that the first of these servants, the first came before him saying, Lord, your mind is made, ten mine is more. And, and the king said to that servant, well done, good servant. Wouldn't you like to hear that as you enter eternity? Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, Jesus, the king, thinks that three years of wages is just a little. Because you've been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten minus. Well, no. You shall have authority over ten other people. No. What's he have authority over? Ten cities. Ten cities. Now, the details here. The first servant here is well done. Because he took what the king gave him and doubled it. And look at this. He gets a reward. We don't like to talk about rewards because we don't like to feel obligated to do anything. But there's a reward here. And the reward outpaces the gift, the ten minus, by an unimaginable factor. And the key to all of this is the servant is faithful. He did what the king asked him to do, and he did it well. He obeyed, and he put effort. He put work into his obedience. A conscious effort. Verse 18, and the second, okay, so we're talking about the second servant here, came saying, Lord, your mind has made five minus. Oh, this guy, he, he's just so embarrassed. <laughs> oh, the last guy made ten. I've only got five. And the king said to him in verse 19, and you are over five cities. Another huge reward 
Return's a little bit smaller, but even at that, it's unimaginable. Clearly, not as much work was put into the five minas as the ten, but the reward far outweighs the work that was involved in it. And again, the faithfulness and obedience of the second servant are rewarded far, far beyond any effort he put in it. Then we see this in verse 20. Then another, and, and the phrasing here is to make us understand that this one's a little bit different. Doesn't call him a servant, just says another. Another came saying, Lord, here's your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. Now, the handkerchief he's talking about was a cloth that you would wear on your neck on a hot day. And at the end of the day, you would put your belongings in that cloth and bury it so that nobody could find it. I buried your mina. And, and, and this guy realizes that this is the day of reckoning. He believes that he knows all about the king. He thinks he's got it. But he's a little bit shaken now that he's standing in front of him. And in verse 21, he says, For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You took what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. So he presumes to know all about the king. I know who you are. I know how you are. Calls him a severe man. Says, you're an opportunist says, you take advantage of people. And he has nothing to show in return other than what he was given. And by the way, he's wrong about the king. I mean, didn't the king just demonstrate that he's a king of grace, a king of mercy, a king who is generous, a king who loves the people with him? This man's arrogance is absolutely breathtaking because now he's talking to the king. He not only evaluates the king, he tells him about it. Wow. So what is the king going to do with this? So in verse 22, the king said to him, I will condemn you. Now, we don't want to make too much of this. This It's not condemnation into hell. This is an evaluation. It's a judgment call. I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant, You knew what I was, a severe man, knowing that I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. So the king starts with, you thought you knew me. You thought you knew what kind of God I was, what kind of king I was. So, verse 23, why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have at least collected interest. Why didn't you make the minimum effort? I mean, it wouldn't have been that much to put it in the bank and gain some interest. Why didn't you even do that? Why did you hide it? Why did you bury it? See, the other, the other doesn't do anything. He keeps his mind hidden. Didn't even do the safest, least amount of effort that he could do. He wasn't obedient. He wasn't faithful. He wasn't even very fearful. He's just mouthing excuses at this point trying to excuse what he'd done, when he realizes the nobleman really did come back, in spite of the fact that there were a lot of people that didn't want him to come back, he did come back, and now he's king, and now he has to answer to the king. And look what the king does in verse 24. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he's got ten minas. Verse 26, I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So we see these three types of people, servants, there's seven more. The story is not about those seven, it's about these three. Two who are thankful and work hard to show a return for what they've been given, pouring themselves into it, and receive a a reward beyond imagination. They've got cities. And one who misjudges the king and doesn't get anything. Now watch this. He's still a citizen of the kingdom. He's not kicked out. I'll tell you why in just a second. He just made some presumptions about the king that were inaccurate. They were wrong. He thought he didn't have to do anything, so he did nothing, and he received nothing. Still in the kingdom, but no reward. Well, wait a minute. There's a fourth type of person, and this is how we know the third guy's in the kingdom. Remember the people who didn't want 
the nobleman is king. Don't come back. We don't want you. Look what happens then. Verse 27. But as for these enemies of mine, see the third guy's not counted in the enemies. As for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and, well, let them in. They're good people. Oh, you know, we've got a loving king and he's willing to excuse everything. Bring those enemies of him and just let them be part of the kingdom because a, a loving king would never, would never do anything to the people that lived in his kingdom even though they rejected him. What's the word say? Slaughter him. It's a violent word. It's a terrible word. In particular, if it's being levied upon you. It's not just violent. It's tragic. It's traumatic. It's like the worst thing that can happen. Slaughter them before me. So we find these three types. Two are faithful and work hard with what they've been given. And and one who misjudges the king and gets absolutely nothing. And a fourth type who totally rejects the king and is slaughtered. So the point, the point of the minas is clear. The servants of the king receive rewards according to the effort that they put into them, what they've received. Not as a duty. We have to understand this. Not as an obligation, but as a way of honoring the king, as a way of showing their appreciation. So clearly, Jesus is clearly talking about those who follow him. Those who believe in him, the servants, and what he expects him to do while he's gone. I'm going away just like the, the nobleman. He expects him to use their, their talents, use their minas, use their gifts, and expand the kingdom until he returns. And for their loyalty, for their faith, for their obedience, they will be rewarded eternally. It's an incredible moment. Two responses to the gospel. You have the tax collector. Zacchaeus has to come down from the tree. But I want you to think about this as well. We talked about the distance between Zacchaeus and, and Jesus. The crowd is standing in the way. Does that ever happen to us? Does the crowd ever get in the way between us and Jesus? The murmurings of the crowd. The complaints of the crowd. The preconceptions of the crowd. The issues of the crowd. So it's not just that Zacchaeus comes down out of the tree. He went up. And why did he go up the tree? So that he could see Jesus better. So that he could rise above the crowd. So that he could do away with all of the issues and all of the complaints and all, all of the, the, the grumbling of the crowd. And what were they grumbling about? They're grumbling about the Romans. The government is corrupt. They're grumbling about people that don't belong in the kingdom. What are you going to do about those sinners and those sinners and those sinners and those sinners? Not much has changed in 2,500 years. Zacchaeus rises above that. The crowd's busy making assumptions and being wrong. They're doing everything but doing what Jesus says. They're active. They've got full lives, busy schedules. They're doing everything but what they've been called to do. And they're doing everything but what Jesus is doing. And what is Jesus doing, brothers and sisters? He's spending time with sinners. Saving the lost. Zacchaeus rises above the crowd, puts aside all the distractions, and gets to know Jesus in a life-transforming way. And we got the, the talents. It's clear that God expects us to do something with what he gives us, something for the kingdom, something for his glory. Regardless of what some people may say, our salvation, listen to me carefully, our salvation is not for us to enjoy. It's not the primary purpose of our salvation. There's nothing wrong with enjoying our salvation. Okay? But God didn't do all this just to get you and me into heaven. 
If he did, he would have taken us up there the moment we got saved. Okay, you're in. He leaves us here to do the things that Jesus says to do while he's gone. And our behavior, we're transformed by all this. And our behavior should, should demonstrate that appreciation, demonstrate that transformation, not out of obligation, but out of the same joy that Zacchaeus had. Wow. There are rewards to be had, brothers and sisters. They're waiting for us. But we have to be productive here. Works has become a bad word, hasn't it? Oh, no, no, that's about works. We're not here to do works. It wasn't a bad word to Paul. It wasn't a bad word to James. Listen to this. Paul said in Romans 3.28, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Now, if we just hold on to that, we go, we don't have to do anything. But see, we got to take James into account as well. Because, because why? Oh, because it's Scripture. And people tell me, oh, James shouldn't have been in the Bible. You know, they had a big argument over that. They did not. They did not. So what does James say about this? James 2.18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Faith and works are inextricably linked. If you have one, you will demonstrate the other. It doesn't matter which one you want to focus on. You can't divorce them from each other. So we see that a response is necessary for the gospel. But the response, and this is important, the response is not returning God's favor to him. I'm saying you did something nice for me, so now I feel like i got to do something nice for you. We're not paying them back. We don't have to do it, but should, we should want to. If we understand grace, if we understand mercy, we should want to. We have work to do. We have work to do. We can work together, but we have to understand The cities are waiting for us. Cities are waiting for us. A reward beyond imagination is waiting for you and me. It doesn't mean that if you haven't done anything and you get to heaven, I don't think the thief on the cross did much. I don't think he's out there going, on oh, and get a reward. I think he's thankful, appreciative. I think he's worshiping. But God says, use what I've given you. Let there be a return in the kingdom. Don't just languish in your salvation. Make it apparent to the world. God says some participation is required. Kelly and I felt trapped in that hotel room in Manhattan. When I thought we were done, the guy sitting in front of us said, this is Beverly, she'll take you to the door. <laughs> she walked us down the hallway and opened up the door. It was another office. <laughs> There's a lady sitting in there, just wanted to have one final word. We felt trapped. Brothers and sisters, God doesn't trap us. He's not trying to get us to do something. These people were trying to get us to sign up for vacation. God gives us eternity by his grace. And our response to him should be to offer up our very best. We have opportunities to do this. We've got the backpack program. We're going to have a work day soon. And the great thing about when we get together, and, and this is where I just feel so honored to be part of this congregation because you guys get this. When we ask for participation, we get it. And I'm hoping the people out there are listening to this as well. Because you're the example. And when we need help, you help. And we help on a lot of different levels. There's ways to help financially, ways to help by prayer, ways to help by teaching, ways to help. If, if you saw how many people come through this facility during the week, the week, you would be amazed. People that are devoting their time and their effort to keeping our church functioning. And we are profoundly grateful for that. Let's spread the word. Let's show the world what the body of Christ should look like.
we're going to go to the communion table. What a wonderful time for us to just look inside and say, what type of participation does God want me to do? You know, many of you are going to answer that question, I'm already participating. Fantastic. Fantastic. But if you're wondering about how to participate, if you're wondering how to be part of this incredible thing that's happening here, last month we went out to 59 countries and there were over 400 sermons downloaded. So the world is listening to us, brothers and sisters. Let's show them how it's done. Search your heart, go before the Lord, and ask him what part you play, what participation do you want from me. We're going to hand out the elements. Um, There are these little packets. I'm going to take one of the easy-to-open packets and give you guys the hard ones. But you just peel the top off. There's a wafer in there. We'll take that wafer together. Uh, and then you peel the second covering off, and we'll, we'll take the juice together. I'd like to have the deacons come forward. I, I really did take the hard one. Don't tell anybody. Okay, if you'll hand those out. Use these few moments to reflect upon what we just heard. Lord, we give you thanks for an indescribable gift. We can't imagine how you did this, Father. But you came down, walked among us, lived with us, Father, sat with us, ate with us, breathed our air. And you're God. It's hard for our minds to process this, Father. But what is even more difficult is that after spending 30-some years with us, you sacrificed yourself. Why? Because we're sinners. Because we can't save ourselves. Because there's nothing we can do to pull us out of the hole that we've dug for ourselves. So in your grace and your mercy, you did it for us. Let us never lose sight of that night where Jesus set the example for all of us and held up a a piece of bread, Lord, a crust of bread, and changed our perception of bread for all eternity. Because he said, this is my body. This is my body. And as he broke it, we realized that he was breaking his body for us. Not only did he break it, but he told us to make it part of us, to consume it, to let it come inside and change us forever, take and eat. And next he he held up a cup and he said, this is my blood 
And now, now we know that the body is broken, that we might be brought into your presence, and the blood is shed, that we might be cleansed, that we might be able to be with you forever. But there was so much more going on in that moment. He gave up his body. The only thing left was his blood. And he says, I'm giving everything. I'm sacrificing everything. And if you believe in me, you'll have eternal life. It would have been a dark hour, Lord. Except you came out of the tomb. You gained victory over death. Victory over sin. And we find out that as you sacrifice your body and your blood to cleanse us and bring us into your presence, that we don't have to worry about the consequences of sin and death. You've taken care of them. And all we need to do is call upon you as our Lord and Savior. He held out that cup and said, this is my blood shed for you. Take and drink. So Lord, we sit here today as your body, united in you, united with each other. And we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for having mercy upon us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for saving us, Lord. Help us, O oh Lord by the presence and the power of your spirit to walk in a manner worthy of the high and holy calling you've put upon us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today here in the sanctuary. Thank you for joining us at home. I'm looking forward to worshiping with you again next week.